Okay. Hello. 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 Shh. Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know me, my, my name is Paul Fonsell. I'm one of the co-founders of The Conduit. Um, and it is an incredible pleasure to have Nurul Rubini here with us um, to discuss his latest book. Um, if you read the numerous reviews, and the book has been received a number of accolades and has been shortlisted as one of the best books of the year by the Financial Times and is getting a lot of press and attention, um, one of the reviews that I sort of was pouring through over the last couple of days said, um, this is the kind of book you will like if you enjoy horror movies. Um, <laughs> which may be you know, giving you a slight sense of what we're, what we're in for. Um, and in some ways, as you know, um, holding this conversation is a violation of one of the kind of conduit's clear precepts is that we spend a lot of times focusing on solutions to the world's biggest problems. And um, we, we sort of have a rule that you can't spend more than 10% of the time talking about the problems and you have to spend 90% of the time talking about um, the solutions. I think we're going to make an exception to that today um, based on this book, but I am in my panglossy and rose-tinted way going to drive Nouriel to see if we can actually find some solutions. A small fact, the book is 273 pages long. There are a bare six and a half pages devoted to a more utopian future, um, and I suspect that's because kind of didn't really believe it um, or your publisher told you you had to write it um, but so we go so I'm giving you a tone for what we're going to go through today so um, maybe we should start by just setting out your stall um, and and telling uh, this really interesting audience why you think these mega threats are so pernicious and how they interrelate and why it's going to be so particularly tricky to seek to address them yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I just arrived from the US this morning, so it's great always being in London. It's one of my very favorite cities in the world. So back here after COVID when we can still be in person again. Um, well, you know, the, usually, you know, I'm an economist and economists believe in the concept of uh, comparative advantage. That means uh, stick to what you know best. In my case, has been economic, monetary, and financial issues and risks. Uh, my, my previous book was on the global financial crisis titled Crisis Economics. But then, you know, during these long two or three years during COVID, I started to think about the world at large. And I think for all of us, COVID was an occasion to think about what's going on in this world. And I realized that we live in a world that in addition to a variety of economic and financial risks, uh, has also other risks. Uh, geopolitical risks, uh, environmental risks, health related to pandemics, uh, risks deriving even from technology as AI may destroy uh, most jobs. There's the risk of uh, deglobalization. There is a backlash against uh, liberal democracy, uh, both in advanced economies and emerging markets and populist uh, extreme radical parties of the extreme right or extreme left are coming to power around the world. So I figured out that to understand this world, you cannot just uh, focus on the economic stuff, but you have to take a more holistic approach. So there are 10 uh, mega threats that I discuss in the book, and it's a bit like a 10 by 10 matrix in which each one of them affects the other and vice versa. So to understand this world, we have to understand it in this more holistic way. There's this new concept that uh, is also emerged recently of poly crisis. Adam Tuz wrote just a piece on FT a few weeks ago. There's a similar idea that all these things are interconnected and to understand the world and resolve this problem, you cannot take them individually, climate change or pandemics or economic crisis or AI. And so that was part of the background. <clears throat> the other background is that, you know, I'm, I'm 64 
Uh, I was born in the late 50s and I lived between the Middle East and, and Italy and Europe uh, until the early 80s when I went to the US for grad school. And I don't know about you folks, I mean, there are a bunch of younger people than me, and some of them may be closer to my age, but <clears throat> when I was growing up, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know, I never worried about uh, war between great powers or the risk of a nuclear war between great powers. Because, you know, after the detente between the US and the Soviet Union in the early 70s, and after the opening of US to China, Nixon went to China, the risk of nuclear war among great powers that was really low became totally insignificant. You know, I grew up and I never heard about uh, global climate change, 60s and 70s. You know, temperature were rising barely above pre-industrial levels. There were some people worried about limits to growth, the Club of Rome saying there will be too many people and we're not gonna have enough resources, but it was not a story about climate change. I never worried about, uh, never even heard about pandemics. You know, the last one had been in 1918, the Spanish flu. So unless you read the history books, you didn't even heard the concept of pandemics. I never worried about my jobs or jobs of people, blue collar, white collar, being uh, destroyed by AI, robotic, and automation, because we're in the middle of what was the AI winter, right? Some research, zero applications. You know, I, I never worried about protectionism and trade war and currency wars and deglobalization, because actually we're globalizing. The world was opening up, new trade agreements. First, the Soviet Union collapsed, opened up, then China, India, and emerging markets. We had actually 30 years of hyper-globalization. Never worried about uh, debt crisis because debt levels were low, private and public, in advanced economies, and growth was strong, so there was no debt crisis. Uh, never worried even about implicit liabilities coming from aging uh, because we have social security system and healthcare systems that are pay-as-you-go, and as you have aging, more old people, less young, to pay for those things, and now it's becoming a problem. But at that time, you know, there was still a limited aging. Uh, there was young workers growing, and there was migration that was increasing the labor supply. Now there are restrictions. You know, I never worried about se severe recessions or depressions, you know, in the Great Depression, but, you know, economic cycles were mild. Yes, we had the 70s, we had this uh, stagflation because of the two old shocks, but then we had 30 years of great moderation inflation, low and stable economic growth and rising prices of equities and so on. And, uh, and I was not worried about financial crisis you know, until the early 80s, before the Latin American financial crisis, there were none almost, because you know, we had stable financial system, regulation, supervision, capital controls, even some degree of financial repression. So there were no severe financial crisis. And finally, you know, at least I was living, like most of us, in stable democracies, liberal democracies, uh, that were, you know, they were center-right or center-left parties, but there was not the kind of polarization that we see today uh, in advanced economies in other parts of the world. There was no radical populism of the right or the left. Yes, there were authoritarian regimes, but they were usually in poor countries, uh, in advanced economies, with stable democracies. So that's the world in which I grew up, and instead today we have to worry about uh, war among great powers. Uh, we have to worry about uh, climate change, we have to worry about pandemics, we have to worry about AI destroying most jobs. We have to worry about, you know, backlash against liberal democracy. We're in a process of deglobalization. We have more and more severe debt and financial crisis. The economic boom and bust are much more severe. Uh, we're now facing, in this country, in Europe, in the world, inflation and recession, stagflation like we've never seen for the last 50 years since the 1970s. So I think it's a world that is, uh, in which these threats are new compared to the one, essentially, that at least I was growing up with. So we had about 40 years between 1945 and the mid-80s where things were relative peace, progress, and prosperity. But in the last 20 years, these, uh, these threats have been emerging. So we have to be aware of them, and then we have to figure out what to do about them. But it's a very different world. To me, it's like a quantum regime change in terms of the threats that are ahead of us. So can we dig in for a moment? Let's start with what you t you define as the kind of implicit debts. I mean, the explicit debts. Let's talk about what is it about the current debt load in advanced economies, and let's start with those, that is paradigmatically different from the sorts of debts that we've seen previously that have been addressed or ironed out or cured through growth. What is it that particularly worries you about the current state of debt? 
<laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the first three chapters on the book are about, uh, the first one is titled The Mother of All That Crisis, and the second is elaborates on it, and the third one is about employees' liabilities. Uh, you know, debt can be debt of the private sector, household debt, mortgages, auto loans, student loans, credit cards, personal loans, or debt of the business sector, corporation, and other businesses that borrow from banks or issue bonds and so on, or can be debt of the financial system, banks and other financial institutions. So that's private debt, and public debt is the debt of the central government, state and local, and so on. Uh, if you look at these uh, size of these debts <clears throat> as a share of GDP globally, in 1970 the number was a bit less than 100% of GDP. By 1999, the number was 200% uh, of GDP. Uh, last year was at 350% of GDP and rising. In advanced economy, the average is now 420% of GDP and rising. In China, it's 330% of GDP. And of course, you know, you have to make lots of caveats. If you borrow to invest in productive stuff, maybe it's a good idea. But if you borrow to spend in the private and public sector for too much, then build up debt that makes you insolvent, bankrupt, and so on. But there's been a, an explosion of uh, official debt, levels we've never seen uh, literally in the last uh, decades. You know, in the US right now, private and public debt as a share of GDP <clears throat> is higher than it was uh, after the peak of the Great Depression or after the peak uh, after World War II. And we're not coming out of a Great Depression or a major global war. So it's unprecedented. Same thing in the UK or anywhere in Europe or other advanced economies. And in addition to the official explicit debt, as I pointed out, there is also implicit liabilities that are coming from the fact that we've aging of populations that are now more, now more retirees or soon to be retired. There are not as many younger workers. And our pension systems or healthcare system, they're called pay as you go. Uh, the payroll taxes that you pay as a worker then pay for the benefits of the old. But uh, there is a mismatch as people age and there's too many retirees and not enough young workers. And people estimate that these implicit debt, these unfunded liabilities from pension and healthcare system are themselves at least 100% of GDP when the official debt of the government is another 100% of GDP. So that's another huge liability. Now what happened is that uh, for the last uh, 15 years, debt ratios were very high and many institutions were insolvent, meaning they could not eventually pay their debts given their income stream. Uh, I call them zombies, but you know, uh, you can use any term. Some parts of the household sector, some parts of the business and corporate sector, some parts of the financial system, some governments, some countries. Not everybody, not across the board, but you know, there were significant amounts and this debt ratio were rising. While debt ratio were very high and potentially unsustainable, uh, since the global financial crisis of 06, 09, we've had mostly a period of very low interest rates, right? Went to zero policy rates um, in Europe and Japan, even negative. We did quantitative easing and credit easing that meant to buy long-term private and public bonds and keeping the interest rates on them low. So while debt ratios were unsustainable, debt servicing ratios were very low because interest rates on short term and long term were very low. So even the zombies could survive. And anytime we had actually a crisis like the global financial crisis or even the beginning of the COVID crisis, we went back to zero policy rates, negative policy rates, quantitative easing, credit easing, and bailing out household, corporates, banks, shadow banks, uh, high grade, junk bonds, you name it, everything across the board. And we could do it because in, in the beginning of these two crises, inflation was low and falling with the risk of deflation because there was a collapse of aggregate demand. It was like a negative demand shock, a credit crunch. And the difference today is that uh, we have to raise interest rates because now inflation has become a problem in the UK, already double digit and rising, and you have to fight inflation. So as you increase interest rates, what you're paying on your mortgages, on your credit card, on your business loans, on your public debt is rising. So the zombies are gonna go bankrupt this time around. So we had artificially essentially papered over the fact that there was a unsustainable buildup of debt. 
And now the problem cannot be essentially kick the can down the road because now with rising inflation, you have increased interest rates. So that's where I see not only the risk of inflation, not only the risk of uh, a recession, stagflation. The UK is in a stagflation today. Uh, inflation is above 10% and rising. And the Bank of England is officially predicting at least five quarters of negative economic growth. I think it's going to be worse than that. It's going to be more severe than they predict. But at the same time, you also have uh, the beginning of a debt crisis, you know, the turmoil that occurred, you know, earlier this year with the pension fund is a signal of unsustainable public debt if your fiscal policies are reckless. And, you know, given the amount of private debt, uh, uh, how many houses are going to be able to afford the kind of rising mortgage are going to be, all in the business sector and so on. So those are the kind of risks that we're facing right now. And there are these implicit liabilities as well that are another time bomb. Um, tell us a little bit about why you think in that context we're deglobalizing. Um, th there are many reasons why the trend towards a greater trade opening and integration and liberalization is now reversing. I think you had several decades after World War II where we had initially GATT and then the WTO, and a wide range of both regional and global agreements for liberalizing trade in goods, in services, in the movement of capital, foreign investment, movement of labor, technology, data information. Actually, people refer to the period after the opening up of China and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the emerging markets on the global labor supply as a period of not just globalization, but hyper-globalization, massive trade integration globally. Um, there were always problems. In advanced economy, of course, uh, those were uh, workers in labor-intensive manufacturing. Many of them lost their jobs because of cheaper goods and services being produced by, by China. So there was already a pushback by those who were left behind. Uh, because, you know, even trade liberalization that increases the economic pie creates winners and losers. And uh, losers tend to be workers that are in uh, labor-intensive industries in advanced economies when you have competition from then uh, uh, emerging markets. And in principle, economic theory says you could tax the winners and transfer something to the losers so that everybody's better off because the pie is big enough. But in practice, uh, we didn't help those who were left behind. We didn't help them with transfers. We didn't help them by retraining them. We didn't help them by giving them other opportunities. So they were left behind. You know, in the US, uh, those manufacturing jobs disappeared, and the entire communities, uh, millions of people in small towns that are manufacturing, the jobs disappeared, and people became what? Eventually, uh, they became uh, hamburger flippers, right? Those kind of jobs in McDonald's, they were paying much less, with less benefits. They became Uber drivers or Lyft drivers and so on today. They became cashiers, uh, uh, you know, in supermarkets. And by the way, today, because of AI, the last word was globalization, migration, whatever. But, you know, there are now robots in every McDonald's. We can just do the job of a hamburger flipper much faster and better than any of them. And they don't take vacation. They don't have benefits. They don't take even a bathroom break. Uh, you know, I go to my local supermarket, I don't know, in London, but, you know, the cashiers are almost gone, right? You have to do it self-cashier, right? So those jobs are gone. And it's only a matter of time when we're going to have, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles. And from a social point of view, it's great. You know, in the U.S. alone, there are 300,000 people who die in car accidents, 2 million severely injured. Globally, it's millions. Suppose that with autonomous vehicles, we can cut that by 98%. It's not going to be zero. There'll be some accidents, but you know, we could really cut the number of mortality of that. Socially, it's a great improvement. You know, millions of people that die or are injured. But you know, in the US, you have about 5 million Uber and Lyft drivers. You have 5 million truck drivers, teamsters. Where, where are they going to go? They used to be in agriculture. Then they went to manufacturing. Then they went into these low-end service jobs. But even these low-end service jobs are going to be gone. Right? So that's the world we're facing right now uh, in terms of whatever. So the backlash against globalization is because initially it was uh, working class blue collars in advanced economies. Then uh, people started to worry, of course, about the environment. Then people started to worry about the fact that your natural resources or industries are controlled by some foreigners 
resource nationalism. Then they start to worry about labor standards in poor countries being lower. But now it's becoming geopolitics, right? Uh, buying goods and services from countries that are your strategic rivals becomes risky. That's why instead of talk about free trade, there is talk about fair trade, but now of secure trade. And instead of talk about offshoring, manufacturing to China and so on, there is talk about reshoring or friendshoring, meaning to produce in countries that are safe, that are your friends. That is part of the process of deglobalization. And since we have this geopolitical depression, it's not a recession, it's a geopolitical depression, a cold world is becoming colder, and may end up actually in hot wars. You have at least four countries that are revisionist powers, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, but increasingly also Pakistan is effectively a lie of them. These are countries that do not accept the economic, social, trade, financial, monetary, currency, political, security, and geopolitical order that the US, the UK, Europe, the West created after World War II. They want an alternative order. And because of that, now we, we, we don't want to, it's the only process of deglobalization, of decoupling and fragmentation and uh, deglobalization and balkanization of global <laughs> supply chains. But the direction is towards restriction to trade in goods, <clears throat> in services, in the movement of capital investment movements of labor, and data, technology, and information. But uh, I'll make the following observation. Today, the US has convinced the UK and its allies that using the, <clears throat> say, the 5G system of, uh, of Huawei is dangerous because it's a backdoor to the Chinese government, and you don't want them to spy on us. And today, that 5G system drives our cell phones that we all use. Tomorrow, however, those 5G systems together with Internet of Things, uh, billions of sensors on cars that collect the big data, that then using AI, machine learning, and 5G and 6G, is gonna make sure that millions of cars that are autonomous can move together efficiently without hitting each other and picking up people and dropping them in the right place. But it's not gonna be the machine, it's gonna be the AI, the big data, the IoT, the sensors, the 5G is gonna make it possible. Now. You think that uh, China is going to allow that system of software and technology of the West to drive their own transportation system in China? Of course not. And do we think we're going to use the Huawei or the Chinese ones in UK or US or the West? Of course not, because whoever controls that one in a situation of conflict can switch the thing off and our entire transportation system is dead, right? So once you have a restriction to trade in technology because of geopolitics, lots of other things have to be restricted. But it's not just high-tech stuff. I mean, tomorrow, and even today, every piece of consumer electronics, your toaster at home from China, your coffee machine, uh, your microwave is a 5G chip. Why? Because it's the internet of things, right? Billions of devices that can seamlessly work together, and with one snap, you can turn them on and off and whatever not. You know, even, even this, Glass is going to have a 5G chip because in the global supply chains, to move things around, you have to make sure that you know where is what. So, you know, this becomes a listening device, not just your drone or your webcam or this microphone, your toaster, your microwave, your coffee machine. So if you worry about Chinese listening to you, it's not just through your cell phone, it's going to be through your coffee machine tomorrow. So once you go through the slippery slope of saying that we need to have a decoupling of our technology 5G, every single piece of goods and services under the sun becomes a listening device and then you have to completely stop buying anything from china and we're not there today but 10 years from now that's where we're going to be so let's go into the good news of climate then <laughs> you were describing earlier why there are five real constraints to effectively dealing with the climate crisis yeah. let's discuss those well, uh, we do agree on things, most people do. In the US, not. Uh, half of the country doesn't believe in climate change or driven by humans. Uh, but most people believe that uh, it's a serious problem and a severe problem and is a slow motion train wreck. And by the way, it's not a problem 10 or 20 years from now. You know, This past summer, as you remember, massive droughts in Pakistan, in India, throughout Western Europe, of course, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the US, you have a drought from Colorado all the way to California. Just a decade long is going to be like this. 
uh, there's not enough water in Lake Powell, Lake Mead. It's, what level are solo that they find corpses of mafiosos that were killed in the 50s in Las Vegas, right? Literally, that's what they find now <laughs> and under, <laughs> under that stuff. And a, a third of all vegetables and two-thirds of all fruits and nuts in the U.S. are produced in California. And other farmers find that the water rights, they sell their water rights to industry. They make more money doing that rather than by producing food. And that's why, if you look at the data, people say Russia invaded Ukraine, spike in food prices, fertilizers, but there was a spike in food prices globally before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That war made it worse, but there was before. And as you have more desertification, more of lack of water, and more of these things, food is going to become more and more expensive, uh, for example. So it's, it's a huge problem, it's a huge problem all over the world. Now, there's a long list, of course, of things that we should say about doing mitigation, going to net zero, adaptation, and not going to net zero, but then trying to limit the cost or geoengineering solution and you name it. Uh, the question you have to ask yourself is why there is so much green wishing and green washing and talk and lots of the ESG investment is really talk and lots of these statements by corporation and banks about going to net zero is nice it's coming from their publicity and PR. Uh, you know, departments, but there is no substance to it. Uh, and that's the, my point in the book is that for each one of these problems, there are potential solutions, but then you have to ask yourself why they don't occur. So why we don't go for the optimal and desirable path of how the world should be, and instead we end up in the world that shouldn't be. And uh, in a specific case of, uh, of climate change, I think there are several constraints. Constraint number one is domestically in the U.S., but also other parts of the world, some people don't believe in it. Say in the U.S., when the Republicans are in power, they say oh, there is no climate change or it's not driven by humans. So when they're in power, the policies are not doing anything. And uh, now that they're controlling at least the House, same thing is going to happen. Second problem is an intergenerational problem. Uh, you know, young people, uh, a young person today at birth has a life expectancy, he or she, of about 100 years. I'm 64, I'll be lucky if I live another 30 years. You know, I do happen to care about the environment, but of course at the margin, if you're going to live in a world that's going to be destroyed by climate change, you care more about it than if you are close to not being around. And young people don't tend to vote, elderly do. And anyhow, to deal with this problem, you need to do massive expenses and costs in the short run for benefits that are going to occur 10, 20, 30 years down the line. So even young people, are they willing to do individual things to reduce their carbon footprint. 25% uh, for example of all greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock agriculture. In the ideal world we should all be vegan. I tried for three months and I failed, right? Uh, I'm trying to be pescatarian, but it's very hard. So it's tough, it's not just policy solution, but what you can do individually as a human being and as a society, as a private sector, and then the government. So there's this intergenerational conflict in uh, young and old. Third problem is international. It's called the free rider problem. Suppose a country takes a massive effort to reduce their greenhouse gas emission to zero, net zero, and they do it and nobody else does it. Then your know, greenhouse are global. You do all this effort, you pay all the cost, and you're still gonna be burning or whatever not. Uh, and convincing 200 countries to do it at the same time is mission impossible. So that's a constraint. Fourth constraint is the conflict between uh, advanced economies and emerging markets. You know, advanced economies are telling China, India, and so on, should cut your emission to zero within the next 20 years, like we are planning to do. Uh, the problem is that, you know, China and India say, you folks, starting with the UK and US, created this problem for the last 200 years through your own industrialization. If you look at the stock of greenhouse gas emission, 90% of it comes from advanced economies. It's true that the new flow of emissions coming from China, India, poor countries. But you know, you became rich and destroyed the planet and now you're telling us stay poor and cut your growth to zero so that we save the planet. No way, I'm gonna grow like crazy for the next 20 years and once I'm richer, maybe I'm gonna start to cut my emission. And the only way you can convince them is unquote to give them subsidy bribes. But we're speaking about trillions of dollars and what they agreed in Glasgow and Sharma Sheikh is, is a joke, you know, hundred billion dollars, spare change and nobody's going to do anything in those countries. And the final conflict is the geopolitical one. 
uh, in a world in which there is geopolitical rivalry between US and China, we don't agree on anything. We don't agree on security. We don't agree on, uh, on pandemics. You saw what happened during the pandemic. We don't agree on climate change and so on. So it's very hard uh, to do anything when there are these geopolitical conflicts. And final point on climate change. Uh, my former colleague at Yale, I'm now at NYU, Bill Nordhaus, he got the Nobel Prize in economics about three years ago for his work on the environment. He said, suppose we want to achieve the goal of Paris, only 1.5 or 2. Then we have to give incentives for people not to use fossil fuels and use renewable, right? So you have to have carbon taxes. So he says, uh, the average carbon tax that would incentivate people to really switch from fossil fuels to renewable in, in fast time is going to be $200 per ton. Okay, $200 per ton. What's the average today carbon tax in the world is $2, $2 per ton. In US is even less, in Europe is slightly higher. But can you think of any government is going to increase carbon taxes by a factor of 100 from $2 to 200 in order to achieve those targets? No one. The opposite has happened because now energy prices are rising, fuel prices are rising, everybody is of course suffering in the US, in the UK, in Europe with higher energy costs. And what do government do? Just the opposite. They're cutting those carbon taxes, they're cutting fossil fuel taxes, they're subsidizing using fossil fuels. And they're going around the world telling, you know, the Middle East and Venezuela and Iran, produce more rather than produce less. So the point is, talk is cheap, right? There is so much greenwashing and greenwishing and talk about the ESG. But it's all talk and slow motion, we're destroying this planet. So let's stop uh, talking about wishful thinking about what should be happening and let's think about what's happening and whether we can do something about it. Okay, so let's now pivot to yeah. whether we can do something about it. Yeah. So the synthesis of your argument is unsustainable, completely historic debt levels, uh, implicit debt through demographics, an end of easy money leading to stagflation, resulting in predictable currency meltdowns and financial instability, the end of globalization for the reasons you've described, the job eroding nature of AI, a resulting new cold war, and the devilish problem of climate change, all interrelating in ways that accelerate each other and provide a very thorny problem. Now, we're all gonna go and curl up in a corner, get fetal and weep in relation to this, or we can begin to say, how do we unthread this? And you begin to do so in, 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 in your chapter. And you say, five to 6% economic growth in advanced economies will help ease many of these problems if we can achieve it. And then, then it begs the question, how are we going to get that five to 6% economic growth? And I would suggest to you, and you, you say it yourself, but I want to spend some time elaborating on it, that the innovations and the tech and the wealth creation and the trillion dollar industries that emerge from climate and from dealing with climate may provide some part of the clue. You suggest it's fusion, but you can go all the way down. You can say AI enhanced alpha fold, helping with new forms of protein, leaving new forms of food. You can think about electric vehicles, battery storage, smart grids, new forms of buildings, new ways of distributing and dealing with energy, new forms of built of environment. That virtuous set of circles through climate seems to me, if you were to take a bet or a road into tackling those 10 problems, a really good place to start. Do you agree? Well, uh, I do have a chapter 12 about the more utopian future. And in that chapter, usually when people talk about solution, there's always the traditional rhetoric. We need leadership in the private sector, in the public sector, domestic, international, cooperation, blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't happen for lots of issues that have to do with the political economy of doing reforms and the difficulty of having agreements globally in a world in which there is conflict between great powers. So I think that talk about leadership or better policies, blah, 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 is just cheap talk. And uh, we have to think about what can, can maybe save the world. And yeah, the starting point is, uh, is technology because technological innovations for the last uh, 150 years have been drivers of 
greater economic pie, peace, progress, prosperity, and resolving gradually over time many, many difficult problems, starting uh, maybe potentially even with climate change. And of course, if, if, if there'll be a revolution driven by AI, machine learning, robotic, automation, 5G, uh, quantum computing, potential growth that in advanced economy today is 1% in Europe, maybe 2% in the US, could be 5 6%. And if we're going to grow 5 6%, the economic pie becomes so big that, for example, the debt problems become uh, resolvable. Or even if there is inequality, we can tax the winners and transfer to those who are left behind and make everybody better off. And we can find solution for climate, for the environment, uh, for even diseases, even pandemics. We saw the vaccines, how they were created very fast for COVID-19 because in part of, of AI. So yeah, yeah the, the utopian future starts with uh, technological innovation. But then people finish that and say, technology is going to resolve all these problems, so let's not worry. There's stuff out there is going to happen. But then you have to go in the specific. And the specifics are much more complicated uh, for the following reason. First of all, there is all this technological revolution, but yet we don't see the numbers at the aggregate level. Aggregate productivity level in advanced economies is pathetic. It's really b below 1%. So there's a puzzle of why all these innovations don't increase productivity growth. Many of them are little apps that are useless and are more leisure rather than producing anything. And tons of them, you know, they, they give us leisure and, and pleasure, but they're not really increasing productivity. But fair enough, there's all this revolution. So maybe it's only a matter of time where there's a lag between the innovations and where we're going to see the productivity growth numbers. But we don't see them, first of all. Um, secondly, uh, take the solution to climate change. Uh, you know, in my book, I discussed fusion because, in my view, renewable is growing, but not fast enough. Uh, say, in the last 20 years, the share of energy globally is, is in fossil fuels has gone from 82% uh, to 80 And the share of renewable has gone from 8% to 11 The rest of it being, uh, you know, nuclear. It's too slow. It's way too slow. If we're going at this pace, in 20 years, the world is going to be at plus 3, right? Or close to plus 3. It's going to be a disaster. So I think that uh, renewable, I love renewable. I'm all for it and so on, but it's not going to be sufficient. And by the way, a lot of renewable require the use of green metals, and those green metals use a lot of energy. And now we have green inflation because high energy prices uh, essentially uh, imply that the cost of doing all the electric vehicles and batteries are very high. There was an article just the other day saying that, you know, that China is going all the way with electric batteries and vehicles. They need a lot of nickel, where they find the nickel in Indonesia, and they're totally destroying rainforest and everything in Indonesia to produce nickel, right? All those things are actually not considered, that everything has to do with green, requires green metals, green metal requires a lot of energy. There's a lot of destruction of actually the environment, and with high cost of fossil fuels, it's very expensive to do that stuff, okay? so. Fusion, but you know, fusion now looks promising, but unless we're going to have commercial applications in the next 10, 15 years that imply massive amount of energy, very cheaply, with zero greenhouse gases, zero, okay? If that miracle does not occur, then it's, uh, it's too late. So it's a hope and maybe something, but, but, but it is, it is an, a hope and not more than that. So then, then, if I can add a couple of other points. Uh, Technological innovations, historically, and most recently, especially the ones that are related to AI, are capital intensive, skill buyers, and labor saving. So if you own the machines or the capital owns the machine, you're going to do great. Uh, if you're in the top 10% distribution of income, skills, education, and human capital, like I would say everybody here, probably AI and all these apps are going to be initially making you more productive, and you may become actually more productive. But if you are a blue-collar worker or a white-collar worker in a low-value-added profession or even a medium-value-added profession, gradually your job, income, and labor is going to disappear, become obsolete because of AI, machine learning, robotic automation. And it's not just routine jobs that could always be done by the machines. Now cognitive jobs can be sliced like a salami in a bunch of tasks, and all these tasks can be automated. And even creative jobs. I mean, there are now AI 
that uh, create pieces of music or art or write the script of a film. Uh, you know, I'm an economist. Among other things I do, it's not just predicting the world in the next 20 years. I have to try to figure out what the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or ECB is going to do next week when they have their meetings. So far, I can do it better than most, uh, most people. But, you know, tomorrow there'll be an AI that looks at every economic data of the UK, every speech and statement by the Bank of England and the MPC, every reaction function of the Bank of England. It's going to make a prediction about what the Bank of England is going to do better than me. You know, so I'm a top economist. I'll tell you, in 10 years, that part of my job is going to be completely obsolete and gone. So that's, that's the future we're, we're facing, in which there'll be a massive amount of inequality. Final point about technological innovation. A lot of technology innovation derived from governments that want to build bigger and more nasty uh, weapons to fight wars. That's what happens historically, right? You know, we had the first era of globalization, and in 1914, we were one. And during that era of globalization and industrialization, we built bigger and bigger weapons that were used to fight World War I. And then in the 30s, we built bigger and bigger weapons that were used to fight uh, you know, World War II. And eventually, you know, before we had nuclear power, we had nuclear weapons, and we used them in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And today, today the fight about who's going to dominate AI is not only the fight about who's going to dominate the indices of the future, right? Because if you control AI, you control all the indices of the future. But it's also the fight on who's going to be dominate militarily the future. Because all the weapon systems are going to be semi-autonomous or fully autonomous or drones or robot soldiers, you name it. You know, this year, uh, there was a book published in the US by Eric Schmidt, who used to be the CEO of Google, and Harry Kissinger, who was, you know, was the biggest geopolitical strategist of, of our times in the United States. And they, and they say, who's going to win the fight on the race to AI between China and US? It's not going to only dominate the global economy, it's going to be also the global hegemonic power in the world. And uh, unfortunately, technology is used to build bigger weapons to fight bigger wars. Uh, and, and that's the negative side effect of technology, and really nastier and nastier wars. So I want to just come back to the technology point because, uh, and not to be rosy tinted or Panglossian for a moment, but just to sort of be rigorous about, about the, the consequence of your argument. If indeed AI has allowed us to sequence the genome and address COVID in record speed, and if AI is allowing can write papers that academics are now marking as if they are students. And if AI can run diplomacy, the role-playing game, and lie and win and find itself in the top 10% of results emerged this week, and if it can displace jobs in the way that you describe and be as transformational in the way you describe, it must therefore follow that it can also be used to address the existential threat of climate in ways that are more rapid than we have previously modeled. And if, if there's nothing about that that isn't true, it seems to me that we need to be doing the biggest moonshot, the biggest investment, the biggest social um, alignments around AI plus climate that we possibly can. And it's implicit in your stuff around fusion and desalinization and all of the collateral benefits of it. Now let me pause and go, the distributional problems that emerge from AI, the destruction of jobs, the concentration of wealth, they need to be addressed because if you don't, you produce populism and disaffection and all of those problems. And it seems to me that we are under theorizing a sort of martial plan on inequality and on job creation. And some of it may be UBI, as you've indicated. But I'd like you to spend a bit of time saying, how do we deal? If, if technology and AI is going to potentially address climate, and if we get in the bargain, loss of jobs and concentration of wealth, then we have to deal with that. And UBI is one of the solutions. But you say, and I, I noted it, you said, I think we should think about an ex-ante pre-distribution of assets rather than an ex-post redistribution of wealth. So will you talk a little bit about UBI, but a little bit about how you, would, how you think about dealing with inequality particularly? Because that seems to be a kind of 
part of the bargain of solving this? Yeah, um, on your first point, yeah. Um, eventually, AI can be used uh, to find the solution uh, to global climate change. Um, and even to do fusion, you have to use really not just AI, but the next step of it is quantum uh, computing to resolve this type of problem where you do a fusion, uh, control fusion uh, in a way that is successful. Uh, the question is wh whether we're going to be able to do that in time. And as I said, you know, if a, a commercial fusion reactor is going to be out uh, 10 years from now, there is hope. Uh, but if it's going to be out 20 years from now, 20 years from now, the, the world is going to be one in which a good chunk of the world is underwater, it's too hot to live, flood, the wildfires, droughts, uh, disaster. And it's happening now. It's not a problem. Today. It's getting worse by the day. And there are actually nonlinear effects, right? I mean, if uh, sea level is supposed to rise by, say, a uh, few meters by the end of the century, but suppose a slab of either Antarctica or Greenland of ice collapses in the water, something not totally unlikely, uh, then you could have sea level of four meters in a matter of months, not in the next 60 years. Yeah. So those are kind of things you have to worry about. So maybe there is, there is hope, but with current technologies, uh, getting to mitigation net zero is impossible. You need to have negative economic growth forever. I mean, 2020 was the worst recession in the last 60 years because of COVID, and net greenhouse gas emission fell by 9%. 9%. It was still up every year, 91% of the level, but below 9 And now with growth coming back, we're having even more. So current technologies don't resolve mitigation, don't resolve adaptation, and nothing else. So the hope is maybe eventually it will happen, but it may not happen fast enough. On, on UBI, of course, in a world in which there is a permanent technological unemployment, uh, the economic pie is so big, if we're going 5 6%, that you can tax uh, those that are better off, transfer money to those who are left behind, not because they're lazy, but because of bad luck. Uh, there is permanent technological employment, unemployment in their jobs, in their industry, in their sectors, and you cannot fully retrain them for so. And that may be the, the solution, either universal basic income or universal basic provision of public services. It doesn't matter whether I give you the money so you have education, healthcare, pension, or if I give you for free the same stuff. You can do it both ways. Either way, you have to tax the ones who are winners and transfer money to those who are left behind. And uh, there is this idea that I discussed in the paper of instead of ex post uh, redistributing income, uh, redistributing uh, ex ante the assets. So if each one of us would have an equity claim on the AI industries or the technology industries or all the kind of biotech of the future, uh, then as they succeed, it's as if we had, uh, you know, all of us 20 years ago, some, uh, some Google, some Amazon, some Apple, some uh, Facebook, some whatever other stocks, and we'll be well off if we had a, a fraction of that and kept it, right? That's one way in which you are essential. But think of it as a form of socialism, right? You have to take essentially the wealth that is highly unequally distributed today and transfer it to everybody else. I mean, US, I don't know, in the UK, in the US, 80% of all equity wealth in the stock market is held by the top 10%. And the top 1% holds 50% of it. And the bottom 80% of income distribution is zero, zero equity holdings. So pre-redistribution essentially is socialism. You socialize the means of production and the ownership of capital. It's a good idea, but it's literally going to socialism. Let's be frank about it, right? That's what it is. And politically, I'm not sure we're yet there. Uh, so there are all these potential solutions. The question is, politically, are they feasible? Are they going to happen? Probably in a democracy, yes, they will be, because eventually those who are left behind, they're going to tax the rich and redistribute to everybody else. Uh, there are ugly scenarios in which uh, countries become totalitarian and they are not democratic anymore and the plutocratic elites uh, control uh, everything and everybody else is, is left behind. So, and if we're going to go in the direction of illiberal democracy, the risk is actually we're going in that direction as opposed to one in which politically we can do those changes. First you, observation. Uh, if you've got that, another important point. UBI may be a solution, but every human being uh, you want to be in a society where you are a productive member of society, right? 
getting a welfare check. That's why many in the US who are Republicans say, I'm against welfare, say, don't give me a welfare check. I want to have a job, I want to make my job in industry or whatever not. I want to have the dignity of being a productive member of society. And if you're not a productive member of society and I'm giving you a check and you live and survive that way, eventually you become obsolete. I mean, today in the US, to give you an example, there's all this underclass is white, by the way, white underclass of people who are poor, skillless, jobless, hopeless, uh, helpless, and desperate. Yeah, they're getting a welfare check already today. It's not UBI, but in fact, it's the same thing. What do they do all day long? They play video games. They live in this virtual reality. Many of them are actually using and overusing opioids. There are two million people in the US that are uh, addicted to opioids. The number is skyrocketing. 5% of them die every year, because out of that stock of 2 million, 5% uh, dies of opioid overdose. So you have 100,000 people dying of opioid overdose every day. Uh, they don't have friends, they live online. They don't even have a mate. They're called incels, involuntary celibates, because you're there, you're desperate, and you can't even find a girlfriend. And they're angry towards women, and some of those go and shoot people, like it happened recently, are that category and they're not gonna even reproduce themselves, and eventually they're gonna disappear. So a world of UBI is a world in which eventually those who are left behind, uh, yeah, they survive a generation or two, but then they're not gonna reproduce and they're gonna disappear. And uh, the world that, say, Yuval Harari describes of Homo sapiens becoming obsolete because of super intelligence, not the world in which all of us are gonna become uh, bionic, live forever, super intelligent. It's actually a dystopian future in which a fraction of humanity those who have the means can become bionic, live forever, and merge the machine to a human and super intelligent, and everybody else is gonna disappear. It's a dystopian future. And that's the likely situation when you go to UBI. Eventually, you know, there's no dignity of world, you're a parasite, literally. I'm not saying it in a negative way, but you are socially a parasite, and you're gonna disappear in a couple of generations. So it's, it's not a utopian solution, UBI. It's actually very dark. So to come back to job creation, I'm, I'm desperate here. I'm clinging on by my fingernails. Um, um, to come back to job creation, if it's not going to be UBI, and we're going to pre-distribute assets in ways that are market-friendly and don't kind of take us to a status, non-market-friendly form of socialism, which those people who believe in the power of markets and entrepreneurship might be a bit wary of, are there models that we can think about which say, these big, highly capital-intensive, technology-driven companies which concentrate wealth but potentially contribute to social utility, we can measure the jobs that they destroy, we can impose specific, more targeted taxes on them, and then we can take those taxes and invest intelligently in the infrastructure to both deal with climate and to create jobs so that you don't have the UBI consequence that you've articulated. It seems to me that there's, there's something there that we can do that is between the polarities of a lot of all jobs and UBI, which contributes to all the undesirable losses of dignity that you, I think, correctly identify. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, a, in the ideal world, uh, there has to be a way or solution so that you make everybody smarter and everybody more productive. So you give everybody some opportunity so that they don't become obsolete. Uh, but, you know, doing it is, um, even if you do the right taxation of those who are better off and so on, uh, it, it, it's very tricky. I mean, today, for every job that, say, is created by Amazon, there are 10 jobs lost in, uh, say, in retail. And I can give you dozens of other examples of how most of the service jobs uh, are begun. I give you the example of the truck drivers or the uh, lift drivers. You know, I'm an economist. You know, there are thousands of economists in the United States. I mean, why do we need all these economists? Uh, many of them are in mediocre schools. You know, suppose you have an online course that's done really fancy, much better than the online courses during COVID. You get the top 100 economists in the country, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, or wherever they might be. And you have, you know, even if you are in Peoria or whatever, in a small town and in Texas, maybe you can take a course with, with the best uh, and highest quality of, uh, of, uh, of instruction on any topic and make yourself smarter. That's the hope of, uh, of online education and so on. That's the, the, the ideal, how to say, 
situation. It, it's, it's very tricky. It's very tricky because uh, <clears throat> uh, historically there was a uh, there was a skill premium that says if you get high school degree you make more money than if you don't have one. If you have a college degree you make more money than if you don't. If you get a, a master degree or PhD you do better. But because of technology uh, and AI even people that have skilled jobs, those skilled jobs, even of PhDs eventually, can be done better by, by machine. You know, even the software engineers that are now, everybody needs a, you know, the computer software engineers to create the AI algorithms. Tomorrow there'll be an AI that does the same thing and does it better. So in finite time, actually, the skill premium disappears and even the benefits coming from education. I mean, if it's true that not just routine jobs, not just cognitive jobs, but also creative jobs are going to eventually become obsolete, then, uh, then it's a problem. Now, John Maynard Keynes in the 30s talked about the risk of technological unemployment, but he thought there was a world in which, because of the economic pie growing, all of us, instead of working at that time 60 hours a week, would work 10 hours, and everybody would be a poet, an artist, a creative type, and so on, and they'd be a happy world of that sort, right? The reality is, first of all, that some of us become more productive. So I happen to work not 60 hours, but 80 hours a week, uh, because it's a world that is interesting and important for me. So I have a job. So those who are actually more productive as so AI work more. And then everybody else, in due time, not today, is going to have no jobs and no income. So it's going to be a very, very divided world of that sort. OK. Uh, so so, yeah. so it's, it's easier said than done. L last question, then we're going we're gonna to hand over. AI tech, climate solutions, bracket, keep that in your mind, to uh, redistributionist strategies to deal with the vanishing jobs and the loss of dignity, but also to create a new group of people who are potentially consumers who are productively involved. There may be some policies we can fashion in that regard. I think they are. The third area is your implicit demographic time bomb. And it seems to me that in advanced economies, unless everybody starts getting enormously more fertile, highly unlikely, the thing that we're going to need is to be able to support immigration, refugees, asylum seekers, the, the wash of humanity across borders. We have to start reconceptualizing as people, as liabilities to assets, that these people are the people who are going to save our demographic problem, will be more entrepreneurial, will contribute more to us in cultural terms, will enrich us, and a whole series of policies which gives them pathways to inclusion and integration. And I'll make one point in that regard. The UK spends between five and six million pounds a day housing people in hotels who are asylum seekers and refugees. A more insane policy you can't conceptualize. You could redirect those assets to building housing that is used to, to, to put people in dignified shelter and then sell it to them over time once you've integrated them and given them real jobs. A more conservative idea I can't imagine, but one which actually could be win-wins. So are there a set of policies that we could fashion which takes what we know will happen, a predictable flow of people across borders, and turn that into from the liability it's perceived to be into the asset that it actually is? Um, well, you know, I'm all in favor of uh, labor migration. And, you know, the story of my family, we're a Jewish family from Iran. You know, three generations ago, we were in Uzbekistan, then we went back to Iran, then from there to Israel, then to Egypt, then to London, then to Italy, then I ended up in the United States. And has been, you know, I've been a, one of the many success stories of being a migrant and study, work hard. And if you look at, say, Silicon Valley, 40% of the tech companies are headed by a migrant, and I'm sure even in this country. Uh, that has led to a lot of generation of uh, wealth and income and, and you name it and all the rest. So I'm all in favor of it. Um, the reality, however, is more complex because just last week we reached a global population of 8 billion people. By the end of the century, it's going to be about 10. In advanced economies, population is falling because of aging, but it's going to be rising in other parts of the world, parts of Asia, uh, Central Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. And those are also the regions of the world that are currently poor. And because of climate change, the damage and so on is going to be risky. In principle, in the past, uh, migration 
from south to north, from poor to rich, is the solution to the issue of aging and unfunded liability and the fact that we need the young workers, the pay taxes and the productive members of society, so and so on. However, uh, there'll be constraint. There is economic malaise. People are worse off. They feel like the new generation are not going to be as better off. And because of AI, many of the jobs, even of the natives, are going to be challenged by technology. So in the past was trade migration that was putting pressure on the wages. Now it's going to be technology. Today, as we know, there's already massive backlash politically against uh, migration. You know, in, in the US, uh, the, by the way, the migration policy of Biden are no different than those of, say, Trump. You don't want to have these millions of people from uh, Central America enter the country. Uh, in Europe, you saw what happened after 2015. First, they let million migrants come from Syria, Middle East, and then even Germany, they, they turn around. The reason for Brexit, among many other, was to limit migration, having control, sovereignty on your migration. And it was not just worries about people coming, say, from the Middle East or wherever. Uh, you were worried about the Polish plumbers, right, stealing your jobs. Now they're gone and everything's more expensive, and that's why you're in inflation and recession. So it was a stupid idea, but uh, you made that choice. So, and the usual rhetoric is these, uh, these migrants, uh, they come to our country, they crowd out public services, whether it's education or housing or healthcare, leaving aside that they have a different culture, religion, blah, 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 and so on. And there's elements of racism and discrimination and whatever not. But the reality is that even a few hundred thousand people coming to Western Europe, coming to the UK or coming to the US now has led to a massive backlash. That's the reality of it. And it's going to get worse because today you have a few hundred thousand people coming from Central America. But in the world of climate change, there is estimated that about two billion people globally are going to be living in places that is too hot or flooded or sea level rises. You know, 40 percent of all global population is in coastal areas that are going to be underwater. So if you worry about the one million people trying to enter in, the, in Europe, wait until you have 10 or 20 million every year trying to enter into Western Europe from Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa, or 10, 20 million per year coming from Central America. This is becoming actually, <clears throat> from a climate change, a total disaster. There's massive desertification in El Salvador, in Guatemala. The farmers cannot survive. They go to the cities. They cannot survive in the cities. There is violence. There are failed states. And then they try to move to North because they're hopeless and they do the right thing, but we say, sorry, we don't want you. So wait until there are billions of people who want to enter advanced economies. And what's going to be the reaction to that? I think the reaction is going to be, sorry, we're not going to let you in. So I'm going to turn over to the audience. I, I, I will say that we had a dinner last night at the Conduit in which somebody who's been doing polling on attitudes to immigration for the last 30 years said this is the first year that they've seen a net positive attitude to immigration in the United Kingdom ever. And I think it's in part because of Brexit, in part because of a, a perceived loss of skills and richness and diversity. And I think there may be ways, if we're imaginative and bold enough, politicians and entrepreneurs to be able to reshift the narrative to say, these people are here to save us, not to imperil our life. You just need to control the narrative. That's my view. Um, Sir. So, Hi, um, my name is Ronald Kopaldas. I have a question around the changing global order and where India and Africa features in that. <clears throat> well, in that changing global order, as I said, there are at least uh, five revisionist powers who are essentially challenging the West. Uh, they are uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and Pakistan. Uh, India is sitting in the middle because, for example, during this recent uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, they tried to, to straddle you know, the, the question of whether supporting the West or, or not, in part because they depend on Russia for weapons, in part because they depend on Russia for now cheaper oil and gas that is being diverted, and food and fertilizers. So I think that tactically India uh, is there in the middle, and historically India was, unquote, among the non-aligned countries, was one of the leaders of them, neither with the West nor with communist China or communist Soviet Union in the past. But uh, geopolitical and geostrategically, I see that India is going to be essentially part, uh, part of the West. Uh, it's already a member of the Quad, 
and the Quad is there's a security alliance between uh, US, Japan, Australia, and India that effectively has the aim of containing uh, uh, China. NATO officially right now has already said that we're going to pivot to Asia because the US told the Europeans, listen, you want me to help you with NATO in Europe to uh, contain the Russian bear? Fair, I'm going to do it. I'm going to spend lots of money. I've done so since 1945. But the threat now is China, and then we have to have a strategy uh, to contain China. And China is as much of a threat to Europe as it is to the United States. And then you have the coalition between US, uh, UK, and Australia, the AUQS, also about containing China. So you have three, essentially, groups that are essentially trying to make sure that the rise of China doesn't become very aggressive. And India, I think, is going to be with the West. It's going to be the West because it's a liberal democracy, it's a relatively market economy, the same language and culture comes back you know, to the British Empire, but also has massive uh, territorial disputes with China. Uh, the two big powers in Asia are today China and India, India being a rising power. You know, India now is growing 7-8% much poorer than China, but the growth of China has gone from 10 to 5 now to 2, 3. So in the next 20 years, even without reforms, uh, India is going to be emerging. And there are massive tensions between them. There have been even skirmishes, and the territorial disputes are severe. And then there's the issue of who's going to be controlling Sri Lanka. China is trying to control Sri Lanka, and that might be causes badly for, for India. So I think that if the Indians are thinking about it, uh, their, their role is with the West. You know, French shoring, by the way, means that capital is going to move out of China and go to friends of the United States and the West. Vietnam could be one of them, Indonesia, Malaysia, but India is another one. Uh, India has had a comparative advantage in services, but it can become even a, a manufacturing power challenging, uh, challenging China. So I see that, you know, that the Indians will have to make choices. Right now they're sitting on the fence, but uh, uh, the rival is China, and the threat is China. So they'll have to fully ally themselves with the West, and I think in due time they're going to go there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Max Richardson. Um, Two questions. One can be answered very, very quickly. So, first of all, have you spoken to Adam Tooze about polycrisis? It sounds like there's a huge amount of um, um, overlap between what you're talking about, yeah. what you're talking about, particularly the the kind of non-linearity of the feedback loops that are involved. Um, but also, what is what is the role of the financial sector in terms of allocating the capital, if any? I mean, some argue that there's no role, but is there a role for the financial sector in allocating capital to solve some of these problems? Yeah, no, I, I'm in touch with Adam. I have great respect for him. Actually, the concept of polycrisis uh, is involved in a broader group of people that are now doing research about this idea of polycrisis. Uh, I would say I wrote an entire book about polycrisis. People are starting to think about these issues and writing papers and so on. So, but there is, a, there is an overlap uh, between those ideas. So many different people are thinking about the same issues, uh, whether you call them mega threats, whether you call them polycrisis, whether you call them, you know, whatever else, uh, the labor is not, is not that important. I think people are recognizing these are all interconnected threats and we have to address them uh, in an interconnected way. But that makes it harder, right? If it was just each problem has its own solution and so on, uh, it'll be easier. These things, as, that's why, you know, I have a chapter about you know, the dystopian future where all of these things uh, materialize and becomes a nasty vicious circle where it's not just the end of, you know, our savings, our income, our jobs, but it's the end of the planet, it's nuclear winter, it's lots of other ugly stuff, it's the end of humanity. And I cannot rule it out, frankly. It's a slow motion train wreck right now, given how we are behaving right now. And unless we're changing soon enough, I think we're headed in that direction. But there may be hope if we do the right thing, but for now it's more hope than real real solution, frankly. Um, you know, the role of the financial sector, you know, there is all this talk about ESG investment, environmental, social, governance, and so on, is, is uh, so far is all uh, uh, greenwashing, frankly. You know, they've taken trillions of dollars of uh, stocks of companies that 10 years ago were considered to be polluters, and now they're saying uh, they, they are part of an ESG investment. Uh, what they've done, they have a nice little report saying in 20 years we're going to go to net zero. There's a report. 
It's fluff, frankly. 99% of corporates would say we have a plan to get to next zero, they're lying. And uh, so you're relabeling stuff because there is some corporate responsibility, there is some uh, hope of doing uh, some net zero and so on. And based on that, you're saying, uh, well, they're going the right direction and there are ESG investments. Uh, I, uh, you know, in principle, there, there, there'll be a role. But so, some of the, by the way, some of the implication of that pressure are counterproductive. I'll give you the following example. Um, there is a huge amount of pressure now on fossil fuel companies to start reducing capacity of fossil fuels, right? Is the shareholders, is the investors, is the SG, is the you know civil society, is the banks telling them, is even the central banks, the central banks are telling the banks, uh, you should do stress tests on stranded assets coming from being invested into fossil fuels. And you should not anymore lend money for these kind of projects. And now that has led to at least big oil around the world to invest less into uh, fossil fuels. Big countries that are producers, they don't care in the Middle East. You know, the Aramcos of the world, they keep on producing more and so on. But, you know, big oil, the Exxons, the BPs, the Shells of the world uh, are underinvesting. So what's the consequence of that? We've had now a decade of underinvestment in, uh, in fossil fuels capacity because we care about reducing, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. But the increase in production of renewable has not compensated for the fall in uh, capacity in fossil fuels. And therefore, today, we have a structural lack of supply of energy globally. Now, during COVID, it didn't matter. Demand collapsed and price of oil in April was zero for certain types of oil. But now that the economies are growing, even mediocre, 2%, there's not enough supply compared to demand. And even, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, we had Brent at $100 a barrel, $100 a barrel. And of course, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it spiked even more. So, so we have the fundamental problem that while we are bashing big oil and we're underinvesting in stuff, since we're not creating enough renewable, there'll be a structural problem. Now there is a spike in energy prices, gasoline and heating and you name it, and everybody now is cutting everywhere. Uh, fossil fuel taxes, because of course, every average person in the world is suffering out of the rise in, uh, in all prices, right? Um, so it's, it's counterproductive in, in some sense, uh, that, that effort, because, you know, one thing is to bashing big oil, rightly so, but another one is to find an alternative. If you don't find an alternative, there's no growth, or there's growth with high energy prices, and that's the world we're facing right now. Thank you, Professor, for ensuring that I'm not going to sleep for the next three nights. Um, I have a question. So my background is in international relations, and similar to economics, we always start from the assumption that players are rational, players are rational when they take their decisions, and not necessarily in good faith, but in their self-interest. Now, the question is, do you see a business case for addressing your mega threats, you know, a real business case for the players who are decision makers in this economy. Like, you know, this economy, as you were saying, is very polarized. Um, you know, the income inequality has ex exacerbated really in the last, in the last uh, 20, 30 years. So those are the decision makers and, you know, they seem to be pretty safe from from most of the effects, right, of these mega threats that you are saying, you know, they can buy out and just move in, in places which are less affected by climate change and so on. So do you think there is a business case? Can we create a business case for addressing these mega case, uh, mega threats? And if yes, who are the players we should look at? Um, probably there is a business case. Uh, so when there was the first industrial revolution, of course, uh, there was a huge increase in inequality. Workers were having miserable labor conditions. They didn't have a minimum wage. They didn't have a pension, health care, and so on. You know, it was ugly in the factory towns of, of the UK, really. They were living like, like slaves, literally, and baked in polluted and diseases, you name it. It was really pretty ugly. And then, uh, you know, Karl Marx came, and then socialism and so on. And there were, there were you know, beginning of a labor movement. And there was a risk that eventually there'll be a revolution. And uh, the enlightened bourgeois, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, decided, okay, we're gonna create a modern social welfare uh, system because we need to have minimum wages, we need education, we need benefits, we need to have unions, we need to provide them with social services, otherwise there'll be a revolution. 
and we created the modern mixed economy with social welfare system. So uh, most countries became, you know, social democratic, but not revolutions. In the place of the world where did, that did not occur, where you had essentially oppression of the workers, uh, whether it was China or Russia, you had the socialist and communist revolutions. So today we have the same rise in income and wealth inequality. The rich are becoming richer, the poor are becoming poorer, the middle class is getting hollowed out, and either, either you're going to have a, a change in policies in a more progressive directions, or otherwise we'll have, first of all, social strife. Two, we're already seeing why we have this rise of populist parties of extreme right or extreme left uh, all over the world. is because uh, there is economic malaise, people are left behind, there is rising income and wealth inequality, and people believe that uh, the elites uh, control the economy, control Wall Street, control the city, and uh, they do stuff for their own benefits. So the first step is uh, uh, polarization, then there is populism, and eventually you could have uh, uh, no revolutions or civil wars or strife or, or you name it uh, in the extreme case. So yeah, so if, if you are in the private sector and you're caring about not ending up with a real social strife and violence and whatever not, uh, you have to start thinking about caring about your workers and making things more sustainable. Otherwise, uh, we end up like, uh, like China and the Soviet Union down the line, absolutely. Is it, is it enough to, to get us there fast enough? Uh, maybe yes, maybe, maybe not. There are many people in the business sector who talk about stuff, but then at the end of the day are not willing to, to pay the cost of redistributing or having a better system. And, and globally, unfortunately, the main global problem is that Whenever you have a global hegemon, that global hegemon, it's a concept in international relation, provides global services because you can internalize all the externalities. So in the 19th century was uh, the British Empire providing free trade, security with Navy, and other things all over the world. In this century has been the Pax Americana and the American Empire providing all these things, including security. Security in Europe, security in Asia. That's why we have not had major wars in Asia or in Europe, in spite of the fact that this major war could have occurred actually in Asia more than in Europe, because the territorial disputes in Asia are much more ugly. I mean, China has problems with Japan, with Indonesia, with Malaysia, with Vietnam, with Japan, with India, with everybody. I mean, literally, if the US Navy and military was not there, you'll have massive wars. You have the beginning of World War III in Asia. Uh, and it's not just because of Taiwan. It could be anyone. It could be India and China, and so on. So, so some of this to provide global public goods, when you have a global hegemon, you have that. In a world instead in which there are great powers, China, US, Europe, rising India, uh, you have conflict between great powers, you have two cities traps, and you don't have the provision of global public goods. That's the reality of it, actually. On everything we disagree, on climate change, on health, on pandemics, on financial issues, on security, and name it. It's a world of conflicts, of cold wars that are becoming colder, and eventually of hot wars. So if you can do that when you've just got off a plane, I mean, extraordinarily impressive. So I think we're out of time. Um, because it's the conduit, I am just going to say three things. One, the next $10 trillion industries are going to be in climate. That's where the great wealth is going to be created in the world. That's going to save us. Technology is going to do things quicker than we've ever modeled, and there's good reason to be optimistic about that. We have to solve inequality, job creation, and the movement of people across borders, and we're capable of doing all three of those things. And everything this man said you should listen to, notwithstanding that optimistic note, because it's what enables us to tackle those assertions which I stand by. But incredible gratitude. Thank you so I, much. I fully agree, by the way, what you're saying. Uh, if you read my book, some people say it's depressing, but it's really a, a call for action, right? We've been, for the last decades, kicking the can down the road, putting our head in the sand like ostriches, pretend that it's not a problem, and you know, pushing the snooze button every time and going back to sleep, and we're sleepwalking into disaster. So it's, it's a call to say, let's not pretend these things are not there, and let's admit them, and then we can start figuring out the solutions. But we have to first recognize reality before we can change it for the better, right? And that's why you're here, and that's why we're enormously grateful for your insight and for your analysis, and as always, for your attention. And we're going to go act on this rather than get fetal. So go off and do something now. <laughs> <laughs>